So it's time to start a session when, with uh, Jean-Philippe Morel. Uh, Jean-Philippe is a technical art architect at Ubisoft Montreal. Uh, Jean-Philippe has been in the game industry for 14 years, and uh, the last 10 of which he has spent on uh, working on, uh, on uh, engine-related technologies uh, for titles like uh, Prince of Persia and Rainbow Six Siege. So please welcome Jean-Philippe. So, uh, hi everyone. I'm Jean-Philippe Morel, a technical architect on the Rainbow Six Siege at Ubisoft. So Ubisoft doesn't really need presentation, you know, it's already well known for major game titles like uh, Assassin's Creed, Watch Dog, Far Cry. And now, for the rebirth of the Rainbow Six franchise with Rainbow Six Siege. So Rainbow Six Siege shipped in December 2015 on PC, Xbox, and PS4. It is a 5v5 competitive shooter running at 60 FPS on consoles with destructible maps. So a regular update provides constant improvement to the game, and each season it sees new content being delivered on the top of the ship data. So constant content, constant content update is the main topic of this talk. And it, was, it is what makes a huge difference between a ship and forget game and a live game. So the challenge we faced two years ago was how are we going to manage our data in a way that we can make this game evolve for the years to come. So and this was a multi-dimensional problem because like we did over the past 10 years, we needed to take into account loading speed, the multi-platform development, the streaming and installation on the new generation of consoles. And the new thing for Rainbow Six was we needed to anticipate and develop a whole new uh, post-launch development cycle with a, a patching process on top of that. So to explain how we pull it off in Rainbow Six Siege, I separated the talk in three major topics. So uh, how Rainbow Six uh, data generation is working, how our content, pro content, content update process is working, so our patching stuff, and uh, the lessons learned from the past two years. So I'll start with data generation. So to introduce our development cycle, I present you our two data formats. We have some, the development data and the game data. The whole cycle is a well-known pattern, like Rainbow Six developer create content. They submit that to our development data depot that is shared across developers and consumed by the build machines. The build machines run data generation script that generates some platform-specific uh, uh, game data that is then shipped to the customers. So one thing to know is that at Ubisoft, we've been doing open world games and dynamically streamed environments for years. So we are crazy about loading time. So this is a key value of our engines and we didn't want to lose that. So we prioritize the game experience first for all types of hardware. And yes, we still, we, we have and we still have, we will still have to support slow HDDs and even optical drive on PS4, for example. So on, Ra on Rainbow Six, a choice we've made is to avoid any type of loading or streaming during the gameplay. So the maps needs to be entirely loaded at the beginning of each match. That choice was made um, to give as much CPU power to process, uh, to, to give as much CPU power to uh, process procedural destruction, graphics, and uh, to guarantee our 60 FPS. So it is well known to have short loading time, we need to maximize I.O. throughput. So make linear reads, avoid seeks, use clever uh, compression strategies. This is the main reason why we have two different types of uh, two di different data formats. We wanted a flexible one for development and a performant one for our game. So we have an in-house IDL with which uh, we define all our data class definitions. 
those data class definitions are uh, processed by a code generator that generates two different serialization methods. One to output the development format and the other one to output the game data format. The development data uh, is saved file by file that can be accessed, modified, or referenced individually. The game data is saved in one binary block that we call a data block. Each data block contains a binarized uh, list of a whole dependency chain of objects. So from the runtime game engine, we can only load data blocks, not individual files. So that is a huge constraint for our game code. But like I said, we are crazy about loading speeds. Um, from, so from now on, we can just uh, put aside the development data because uh, the, the rest of the talk will focus on the game data. So in this simple example, we want uh, to serialize, to save in our game data, an entity referencing two shared resources, a texture and a mesh. So calling our game data serializer on that entity will uh, serialize all the objects in one highly optimized buffer that is then compressed to make a data block. That data block is then stored into what we call a data file. So in other words, a data file contains a, a set of data blocks, each of them containing a list uh, of compressed objects. So all our game data is packaged that way. Global objects, maps, operators, weapons, customization items, and, and UI. So the question you may ask yourself is uh, why there's no sound on the slide? Well, don't worry, I will talk about sound later. So before match start, we load the required data block, like one for the environment, one for the time of day, another one for the game mode, and the required operators and weapons. This is the minimal set of data blocks to load before a match start to get the minimal amount of seeks on disk. So this was our build a couple of years ago. We had a very high IO throughput, but on the other hand, we had a very high duplication rate, uh, mostly because, um, because shared objects were duplicated uh, around in multiple data blocks. So that was obviously making our, um, our, our files very large, and that was, uh, that was an unreasonable patching granularity. With that, we were not able to, uh, to make an updatable title, because every time we wanted to update something, we basically needed to update everything. So. And worse, our, our, game, our game data format is highly sensitive to any uh, data format changes. So every time we wanted, we were, this meant that we were uh, about to create a full patch every time we wanted to make some simple data changes. So this is where we start getting crazy about small builds and patch sizes. So we needed to prioritize the customer experience uh, it needed to be as seamless as possible for each customer, even those with slow internet connections and uh, monthly bandwidth restriction. Reducing our, our build size was also a good way to reduce uh, operation costs. So that is the moment where I, I sat down with my good friend and colleague, Adrian, and we started discussing about the right compromises to make between uh, loading speed and the granularity of our patching units. So what is an acceptable patching unit? We realize that our compiled meshes, compiled textures, the physics shapes, and the GI data uh, were filling more than 95% of our game data, excluding sound, obviously. But I'm, I'm not talking about sound now. Um, without those, uh, the data files of our map were getting as small as 10 to 15 meg per world. That was pretty amazing, considering that they can those files contain the maps, uh, two time of days, and multiple game modes. So we decided to remove all those data types from our data files and stored them into what we call banks. So we created four banks for our four bankable types. Texture, mesh, mesh shape, and GI banks. Bankable types, like textures, are separated in two parts, the definition and the compile data. 
the definition stays in the game data block, while the compile data has a deterministic generation and are stored as a unique individual binaries in banks. So every time the loader receives a game data block request, we collect all the, uh, the, the, the bank dependencies and request them according to their location on disk to minimize seeks. So about six months before the release of uh, Rainbow Six, we added the bank files to our build with their, uh, re respectively with their compiled data. So the build size uh, got much smaller, more mostly because we eliminated duplication of the large assets. The game data file got very small. We found almost no regression in loading speed because we were still batching and reordering load requests according to the location on disk. And um, the compiled data became what, uh, what I call the, the um, became our patching unit. Yeah, and also, yeah, bank, another good advantage is that the bank objects are, were now decoupled from the, uh, the, the, the game data block were decoupled from the compiled data, which, was a, which is a pretty handy advantage at runtime. So support the widest range of PC hardware was an, un, an important priority uh, regarding data organization. We did not get crazy about that one, but uh, it's another important piece of the puzzle that needed to be addressed. So in a 5v5 uh, shooter like Rainbow Six, low-end PC and high-end PC customers all synchronize phases of the gameplay together. So uh, low-end PCs should never slow down the game flow of other players because their data is not yet loaded. So our strategy needed to, to address that. And we, we also needed to be ready for the future hardware. So we separated our texture bank in five from low to future resolution texture banks. Each of the texture contains a different set of MIP chains configured by our technical artists. This gives us enough flexibility to juggle with different uh, hardware configurations. So according to the uh, customer hardware settings, the game engine will mount only the required uh, texture bank and silently skip the unavailable textures when the loader requests them. Uh, yeah, with the separated texture bank future uh, that contained the high resolution MIPS, well, mostly the 4K MIPS, uh, we got ourselves ready for future hardware and uh, we were able to provide a free optional high resolution texture pack on PC. So the last but not the least, the streaming installation. You know that process that allows new players to start playing as soon as possible. Well, a minimal set uh, of initial gameplay provides a quick entry point to the game experience, and it is also a technical requirement on, for Xbox and Sony compliance. So we did it simple. We simply multiplied each of our files by the number of installation phases that we have in the game. So uh, we added a file identifier on each file, so the build machine script can identify which file goes into which installation chunks during, uh, during the packaging. So this is how the Rainbow Six uh, Siege game data was released in 2000, December 2015. Those four priorities were the, uh, all the pieces of the puzzle required to be ready for, for live operations. So we had our Gold Master, our first release, Call it what you want, but that became our first reference build for our uh, con content update process. So we have tight release schedules. We release a season after we release title update one, two, three, four. Then we ship another season and it starts over and over. So we want to focus on what we ship. We want to take for granted that our patching process works. So on Rainbow Six, we invested early to have a reliable automated patching workflow. So, oh shit, I don't know if you see <laughs> what's written, but before I start writing this talk, I went back to my notes and pulled out the requirements that we, we wrote in July 2015 about content update. This was six months before release, 
And uh, I'm glad to say that those requirements, uh, two years after launch, they are still valid. So we needed to support data format changes post-launch, minimize patch size, automate patch process on the build machines. We wanted a unified solution for every game SKUs. We needed to be ready for a two to three years patching process. And like the wish or the dream was to be able to dynamically patch any properties on the live build. So to fulfill those uh, requirements, we have uh, two type of patches, the feature patches and the add-on patches. So the feature patches are our primary way to, patch, uh, to add, remove, or modify data. Uh, all our title update or season deployments are feature patches. So each feature patch involves a number of first-party processes like uh, packaging, deployment to their infrastructures, and, and approvals. So from our solution, even if first parties provide different ways, uh, well, tools and methodologies to deploy patches, we wanted to have a platform agnostic way to produce them. And most importantly, we wanted, to, uh, we wanted that process to be fully automated on the build machines and forbid any, um, any manual interactions. On our point of view, a patch process needs to be seamless for developers. So our solution has almost uh, no limit to what we can uh, modify or add. And it also supports non-deterministic game data generation because on Rainbow Six, the, we had this huge constraint that, uh, this is a huge constraint we had with the Rainbow Six data generation. So the feature patches are built using uh, what I call the tax and bank concept. The tax, the patch tax, contains everything that will be patched in every title update. We call it the tax because, you know, we don't like it, we don't want it, and we always think, we always wish it will be as small as possible. So uh, we work hard on making this tax as small as possible, and we ship with a 500 meg, meg tax at launch, including the executable, the system files, the shaders, and the game data files. So uh, we all think simple is good. So uh, we think it's also a trivial solution for to support non-deterministic data generation and to support uh, data format changes because we simply patch everything. So we keep a vigilant eye on it. And uh, we know that for every title update, we have to, um, to count this in our patch size. In opposition to the patch tax, the banks are never updated because replacing one of those files will generate a huge, a large patch. So we created a, a process to, uh, to build cumulative banks. And that process requires to have um, deterministic, uh, to, that requires uh, the format of the objects, yeah, the, 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 the format of the object must never change. And the bank must contain deterministic data block only, each of them containing a, a unique bank a unique comparable binary. So finally, our feature patches is mostly built on the generation of cumulative patch banks. So the goal of the process we put in place is to take an input, a reference build, and a new build out of the build machine. In that case, uh, the, the new build, we call it build 101. So the output is the reference build patch with build 101. This is exactly what the developer, the testers, and the end user will play with at the end when we will patch his game at home. So we implemented a patch generator. The patch generator runs on the build machine every time a new build comes out. So it is responsible to make the additional patch bank that includes the modified and the new assets. The patch generator makes the differential between the reference banks and the new banks and generate a, yeah, a build 101 banks that contains the modified and added assets. So the composition of the final build is done by the build machines. So the build machines gather the reference build, the new build, and the, the, the newly generated patch banks. Uh, so it takes the the tax from build 101 because we always patch it, the banks from the reference build because we never patch them, we always put them back in the build, 
and the new banks that contains the new, the new assets, the new and modified assets. So this gives us our full build, like the reference build patch with build 101. And that process is repeated over and over. Every time we release a new title update, the reference build gets updated to the new version, and the content update process is applied. So as a consequence, this creates cumulative patched banks. The side effect of the accumulated, accumulated patched banks is the waste accumulation. For example, if the same texture gets updated over and over in every title update, only the latest one will be consumed by the game engine because the loader will always request the latest one. So the three for in that case, the three first revision of the Rainbow Six logo uh, will become dead data, uh, dead files in our build, creating what we call waste. So the reason why waste is not really a bad thing for us is because we work with the assumption that banked assets were rarely changed more than once. There are some exceptions, but usually if there's a problem with a mesh or a texture, we will fix it just once and that's it. So when we notice that some banks accumulate too much waste, we can delete them from the reference build to create a patch without this waste. We call that the patch consolidation process. We do that, as, uh, we do that operation progressively to make that as seamless as possible for the customers. So how do we test our patches, our feature patches? The magic with that process is that there are, our game build depot contains only patch build. So there are no differences between testing a build or a patch build. The testers don't even know they are working on a patch. From their point of view, they are just testing the latest build. And that latest build is exactly the end result that you, the user will have after patching his game. The only platform-specific uh, manipulation that we have for feature patches is the auto-generation of layouts uh, used to, to generate patch packages. So every platform has their own way to generate patch packages, but they are mostly pretty much all the same. They are all XML, file that that XML files that defines installation chunks, and uh, they can easily be auto-generated by uh, build machine scripts. So that is our primary way to update content, the feature patches. So the second type of patches is the add-on patches. This is our solution for emergency data fixes. Those, the modifications are applied on the live build in real time. So an add-on patch is a small data file that we store on a CDN it is downloaded by the clients and made mandatory to play the game live, li like it is for feature patches. So it contains a data-driven combination of an object, a property path, and a value to be applied. With that, we can tweak any property of any type on any objects in the data, even arrays and, and values inside arrays. So we can alter the behavior of any build, and there are no limits on the amount of add-on patches we can create or remove. So with that, we have an extremely fine and reactive patching granularity. We could exploit that piece of tech way more than just for emergency fixes, but um, it is a very, uh, a very powerful tool. But we uh, decided to use it with extreme caution uh, to avoid the... the the multiplication of permutation this can create in our builds. So on the Rainbow Six floor, everybody knows that guy who can create the add-ons. When the alarm rings, we ask Matt, Matt, can we fix that with the, with the add-on? And Matt opens his property grid. He creates an add-on package with a property path add-on and select the platforms uh, for the patch. He select the objects he wants to modify. In that case, he wants to modify the barbed wire damage datum. So uh, he opens his property path window, 
select the property he wants to, to patch. So he wants to patch the max extra health of the barbed wire damage data from 20 to 60. So we simply put the, the new value in the add-on, save it, submit that to our development data depot, and uh, the build machine is notified that a new add-on is available. Uh, the build machine generates the add-on like we do for our game data and send that to our CDN so it becomes, uh, well, so it's distributed to the, the community and becomes mandatory to play live. Add-on patches. That, was our sec that's, that is our second uh, type of patches. So what's up now? Almost two years uh, after, uh, we had to deal uh, with large patches. Large patches are not desired, but sometimes not, not avoidable. Sometimes unavoidable, so, sorry. And uh, we knew that somewhere in time we would have to change our texture format. I don't know if you're playing Rainbow Six, but we had to do it in the, in the latest, uh, with the release of the last season. So for quality reason, we had to change our texture format and we needed to update all the texture banks. So we did it for, uh, that happened for the other types of banks, but uh, the texture banks are by far the largest one. So major serialization changes will um, require a full remaster of all the files, and uh, we, are, we are also dependent on third-party um, third data format changes also. So the technique we use, uh, we call it the cumulative patches. So cumulative patches comes with a downside. The more patches means more file, more seeks on disk, leading to high IO degradation. So our solution to that is to make regular patch consolidation. Every season we remove all the minor title update uh, patches and consolidate those in, in our season uh, major update. Also, we sometimes we um, manually remove some banks from the reference build when we detect that those files contain too much waste. Since we ship, yeah, we had a lot of discussion about scalability issues. We needed to evaluate and understand the impact of having more and more and more data over a long period of time. More maps, more operators more weapons, more monetization item. What will our data will look like in five years if we continue like that? <clears throat> so yeah, the warning, uh, well, the result of that was like, we, our game experiences must be designed to avoid data scalability issue. We need to think about what, how will our tech will react when we'll have 50, hundreds of operators instead of 10. Products and future products needs to be uh, sold in a way that we don't create, create dead data in our data that needs to be supported forever. Like for example, if we ship an experience and very few, if we sell an experience and very few uh, customers are using it six months, six months after, we will still have to support it in, well, for the, for the lifetime of the game. If, uh, because, because those customers paid for it. So um, if we sell something to customer, we cannot remove it. So we may have to support it forever. Think about it. Sound. <laughs> the, reason why <laughs> the reason why I push back uh, the discussion about sound to this section is because we are using a, a third party sound engine. And uh, like every third-party uh, engine, uh, they have their own way to generate data. And uh, by, like, by in, in that case, it's, they generate sound banks. So uh, by reverse engineering their data, we were able to create a side process that differentiate two banks and create a patch bank, like we do for our banks. But uh, yeah, that works for a while. But you know, after, uh, after two years, the, the sound designers want the new tools, and the new tools comes with a new runtime, so a new data format, and that will generate a 10 gig, pl 10 gig plus patch. 
So we'll probably take that hit sometime. But that said, third parties also need to adapt to the reality of constant update. We don't want to patch the whole sound data every time we update to their latest version. So uh, especially if there are no, if it's not perceivable by the end users. So our suggestions for third party, our suggestions for third parties are uh, use the tax and ban concept, separate media file definitions from the media data files. Use deterministic generation of media data or some way to test for media data compatibility for the automation of patch generation. Provide, if possible, products with decoupled runtime and tools so we can update the tools regardless to the, uh, to the runtime. Finally, uh, well, the solution is working. We have tested this for two years on over uh, 20 million gamers. And it's an important part of the success of Rainbow Six. So thinking, of the, thinking about the future of our content, how it will evolve over time needs to be taken seriously. I'm not saying today that this is the best solution, but uh, I'm, I'm proud and confident to say that, that this tech is ready, uh, Rainbow Six is ready with that tech for the years to come. So I'm Jean-Philippe Morel from uh, Ubisoft. I hope that was interesting or useful for you. And um, thank you for listening. Before we start the question, I just want to mention two awesome guys at, uh, at Ubisoft Montreal that uh, make that possible. So my good friends and colleague, uh, Adrian on the engine and Gabrielle McLean on the build. So I want to mention that. So, so questions. Questions, yeah. Uh, can you a little bit describe the uh, editor's format? Uh, sorry, where's the question coming from? Here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, can, can you describe a little bit about the format for, for major files like a model, uh, spaces, texture in uh, editors for editors? I'm not, uh, sorry, I'm not sure I, get, I got the question. You want me to? F you uh, want me to explain? You describe the. You describe the uh, how you build and prepare uh, data and resources to release, but how you work with this file, with a source file, with a model file, Maya, et cetera, because it's much bigger. It need to be uh, editable, be a separated team, and so on. It will be very interesting you know, how you work with it, how you merge it, how it organize it. Uh, maybe the answer will be quite long to that. Maybe you can take that. Okay. Offline, if you, if you don't mind. Yeah, okay. Uh, sorry about that. And another question here. Um, uh, you mentioned how you perform testing on feature patches. Mm -hmm. uh, does it work the same for add-on patches? Like, as I understood, you could have add-on patches, like uh, much more of them, and they make tinier changes, probably harder to test and find yes. some bugs. Yes, they are really harder to test because they are not dependent on a, on a build. You can apply them on whatever build you want. So uh, the way we work, we have a stages environment, uh, a staging, uh, staging environments. So we have the development environment, the testing environment, and the live environment. So uh, the way we do it, uh, well, the feature patches are, are, are tested build by build, but the add-on patches are tested by like we put the add-ons in the in one environment, one of the staging environment, and uh, that's the scope of the uh, the testing of the add-ons. Okay. Do you test all the versions uh, which this add-on can be applied to, or I don't know some latest one? Uh, the latest one. Only the latest one. Well, we test all the platforms, and uh, well, usually those add-ons are not applied in development. They are they are uh, created to go live. So we look at which build is currently live, and we test it on that version. And you have only one version live? Uh, yes. Okay. Well, one per platform. Okay. 
Uh, do you use some test automation for that, or do you do it manually? Manually. Well, manually. It's, it's, it's automatic. There, there are processes that deploys the add-on automatically, but uh, that's pretty much it. OK, thanks. Want to know at what time is the party tonight? Or? <laughs> uh, hey, so um, when you're doing like uh, small patches, uh, do you have like um, um, a really like big, not a big, uh, like a, a process of like approving those? Um, or you mean by the are, first party? Uh, yeah, maybe by like uh, stakeholders, or is this something like something mm, your like game designer wants to like tweak or change, and uh, he's just like doing this, doing it uh, with the, like a small patch, or is it always uh, like even even the small patch is always a process of like approval, uh, like green light of the of these changes, and only then applying this in like live environment. Yeah, but the reality is that we are not really uh, using this, those kind of patches to to try stuff or to to modify features. It's more like really emergency fixes, like uh, for example. Okay, uh, so like only hot fixes. Yeah, they are they are for emergency fixes. We fix that with add-ons and in the the title updates after we fix it in the build directly. Okay, thank you. So. I have a question. <laughs> Uh, uh, do you use this uh, technique for like other titles in other engines? Do you like knowledge share around with uh, other studios in Ubisoft? With other studios, you mean other Ubisoft studios? Yeah. Uh, 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 other other U Ubisoft, uh, I don't know, um, uh, well. teams that are in other um, working on other titles. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the, the, this is a new word to us. That that way to work. Uh, we were used uh, at Ubisoft. We are we, we were doing like ship and forget game for for a while, like, and that the the Rainbow Six engine is a grand grand grandchild of the Assassin's Creed engine. So uh, we were the first one to make a, a, a game that will well, a, a live game like this. So now we are, right now we are the first one doing that kind of processes, but. Uh, does this answer the question? Yes, yes. Uh, so basically, after the map and all entities are loaded, uh, the code uh, fully yields to the physics uh, processing, right? The destruction and the uh, ballistics. Uh, yeah, the question is, uh, when everything is uh, loaded, we give... I is it true? So after map loaded, uh, the only processes to be handled is physics and uh, ballistics. And physics and what? Ballistics, you know, bullets. Uh, sorry, I, I did not understand the question. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you can just come, come and see me after. OK, uh, well, the question is not connected with the theme, but uh, which version control software do you use in your company? Which version of what? Uh, the version control. Control of the version. The version control yeah. we're using. Uh, we're like using Perforce or? Yeah, we're using Perforce. Perforce, yeah. Okay, great. And why? Why? Yeah. It's mostly because we have so much history that we don't want to lose. We need to stay with Perforce. OK, thank you. <laughs> Okay, um, so besides the sound patching system, um, was it, what's the main thing you would change, I guess, going forward from this for next few Anything next I year? would change with that? Yeah. I thought about it before, like I was asked that question also uh, at, at the studio. And um, seriously, with all the constraint that we have for uh, with the first parties, uh, like you can only f patch file by file, so you cannot implement your own patching process on the first party. So to have one unified solution, I think I, I, I don't think what I can change with that. But if we could implement, we can think about better solutions, but with the constraints we have right now, 
that's a pretty cool solution. Yeah. Do, do you guys actually patch between banks or is it just on a bank by bank basis? For, so for example, maybe, I don't know if you, if you could find a relation say between low and medium textures where if you had the low texture files already, maybe you could actually create the medium ones with some data from the from the low the, the low bank instead. Uh, well, yeah, that would work. That would work with that pattern. But this may. Uh, you, are you saying that you 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 can switch change the 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 low from medium or? No. What 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 I'm saying is that I guess there there is an intrinsic I guess a relation between the low quality daughter and the medium quality daughter for textures itself. So whether you could create, if you already had the low quality bank for textures, whether you could generate part of the data for medium data from the low quality yeah, Yes, we, we could, but it's, that's not a real use case. Like we, we're not using that. Sure. We're not doing that. Um, thank you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, is a situation possible when after patching some uh, file or banks uh, become uh, completely broken and there is no other van than uh, download a game again. Uh, you mean if there is a problem after patching? For, for uh, some users on PC, for example. Yeah, it, it, well, we had a problem uh, recently uh, that some... Well, if, 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 if the process goes well and everything gets... All the files get copied correctly on on the uh, on the on the users machines uh, it will be all right we have but we have a problem where some we had a problem where some um, patch bank were not deleted from the client that created some problems recently but we are fixing that right now i don't know if you if if it answers the questions but uh hi thank you uh I have a question about duplicating textures data in low, medium, and high quality banks. So, for example, low quality version of texture, usually uh, this, data, this data usually contains as lower MIP levels for high and medium quality uh, versions of the same texture. So do you have this data uh, duplicated for PC build? But that process, with that process, we, oh, we, we, we don't have a versioning of the same texture. Like We always have the latest one. So I mean, uh, you have three versions of the same texture for low, high, and medium quality. No, uh, for each, well, each texture bank contains just a, a part of the MIPS. Oh, it's thank not. You. It's not duplicated. It's a, I see. Just to be sure, like if, if there are eight MIPS, like the low will contains, for example, the, the two first one, the other one, the three, four, five, six, and it's distributed. Uh, so I guess uh, let's thank. Uh, Jean-Philippe. Thank you.
So we keep catching our speakers in the hallway and putting cameras in front of them. Hi, please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Samuel Rantaskla. I work for Microsoft as a principal program manager out of Sweden. Okay, Samuel, so let's talk about games. What's your favorite game? Well, I wish I played a lot more games than I actually do. So I have to go back into the past. Like, one of my really favorite games is Jag the Lions 2 from like 92, 93. I think it was made here in Russia, if I'm not mistaken. Civilization, always been a big fan of that. And then the Enemy Unknown UFO trilogy from the 90s. There's so many games, I mean, it's like impossible to select one. But they're all strategic games, the ones that are my favorite. Yeah, you're obviously a tactician. That's commendable. But do you remember the very first game you've ever played? Uh, Decathlon, probably on the x86, somewhere around 84. Wow, that's... Uh, I don't even remember that one. Um, oh, it's like a, you basically play uh, Decathlon and you just hammer at the keyboard to go faster, like 10, 10 different sports events. Played it like crazy. I was eight years old then. <laughs> wow. Uh, how did you get in the, uh, into the gaming industry? It was by chance, actually. So I was studying at Uppsala University, doing uh, computer science. And they had this fair uh, where companies were meeting the students. And there was these two guys that they've started a game company in the basement. And they wanted somebody to write a BSP tree, binary space, space partitioning tree. And I was looking for my thesis. So I figured, let's combine those. So I joined them. I wrote my thesis uh, in the games industry. And then from there, it kind of like just went on. So this was 2000. Uh, but now in 2017, what's your favorite and least favorite thing about game dev? I mean, I think the games industry is awesome. Great place to work. There's so much passion. Um, there's skilled, very intelligent people. Uh, I think that's my favorite thing. Uh, the least favorite thing is that, which I covered in my speech a little bit, I think that we're looking a little bit too much at how do we turn time into money uh, rather than seeing like how do we how do we educate our kids I really wanna that's my passion myself is like take this experience make our kids better today tomorrow than they are today I'm a parent as well so that's coming from that well that's a very noble thing to do I don't know if noble just I think it would be a good thing for us definitely is um, about your speech did you have any interesting questions that maybe stood out yeah there was some uh, interesting questions, like if we look at mixed reality, what's going to happen with that? Where, where, what's the dangers with that? I couldn't really answer them because it's, let's see what happens. But if you were a part of your own audience, what question would you like to ask yourself? Hmm, that was a tricky one. Um, are you sure that you're right? Are you? No. Well, we can be sure 100%, but still, we're trying to foresee the future here. How do you like the conference? Love it. St. Petersburg, great place. Wargaming, excellent hosts. It's a great place to be. You should come to the next one. Definitely do. Uh, say, if you had the chance to go back in time uh, to when you just started working in the industry and give yourself one advice, what would it be? Try one of your ideas out. That's very good. Thank you very much, Samuel. Uh, I hope you like, you like the conference. Thank you. We got another one of our speakers uh, here at 4C and uh, would like to ask him some questions. Hi, uh, please introduce yourself. 
Hey, my name is Eric and I'm the CEO of the Do Dreams Game Studio based in Helsinki, Finland. Very nice to meet you, Eric. Uh, tell me, what's the very first video game you've ever played? Uh, I guess when I was a little kid, my dad was in banking and he had a lot of business trips and he went to Japan and he brought me one of these Nintendo uh, handheld like small, small games. It probably was Donkey Kong. So that's my first memories with gaming and then I played a lot of Oil Panic with the Disney characters, so fond memories with those. Uh, favorite uh, gaming memories, well I like games that I can play with my friends. I remember when I was in high school, we'd go visit my friend's house and we played a lot of these uh, like sports games together, like uh, NHL 95 and some F1 racing games. So I would say that maybe NHL 95 is, is the game that I have played most with my friends and I have fond memories of you know starting after school and then realizing this like 2 a.m. and uh, knowing that my mother will be very angry when I come home late. <laughs> that happened to all of us, I think. Uh, how did you start in the video game industry? What led you here? Uh, I was earlier a marketing uh, lecturer at this business school in Helsinki. And then at some point I realized that instead of talking about business, that I'd like to do business, business myself. Uh, I had my own startup for three years, uh, did uh, different kinds of entertainment apps. I was interested in storytelling and apps and online and social media. Uh, after that, uh, I, I, I did that for three years, failed miserably. But I guess the one thing I learned was to how to test concepts early with real customer data. Because when you have little money, you need to be sure that you're, you're spending it wisely. And um, I had the opportunity to join an existing team. So I joined Do Dreams as a CEO. And uh, together with the wonderful team I have there, we, we, we uh, started with these mini games, eventually came up with Drive Ahead, which is our current franchise that we're developing. Sounds great. Uh, tell me what... Like, like, uh, okay. yeah. 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 Yes, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. Uh, so what's uh, your favorite thing about uh, the video gaming industry or maybe just something you strongly like about it? I think the, my favorite thing about the gaming industry is the community of developers. So uh, traveling around the world, meeting wonderful people who make games. And, and you know, talking to people and learning from them. I think it's really cool how in gaming people are very open to share their experiences uh, about you know the business aspect of running a game studio, management stuff, uh, you know, tips and advice on on scaling and growing a company. It has been very useful for me, and and hopefully by giving talks at events like this, maybe I can give something back to the to the community. Oh, you definitely are. Uh Anything that maybe irritates you or something you don't like about the industry, strongly dislike? Well, uh, I think in recent years, like, uh, you know, games are developed with data and analytics. And that's, of course, very important. And I think all decisions, all the creative decisions should be based on, on data. But what I've noticed, noticed is that um, studios maybe give up quite easily on games and, and their communities. So we have found that, that uh, if we really invest in the community and take care of the players by making regular updates to the game, thinking the game, of the game not as a product but as a service, then the community will support you through difficult times. Uh, what trends do you think are going to persist or maybe appear anew uh, in like a 10 years time? Let's make a prediction. Oh, that's uh, that's a very tricky question. So, with uh, everything developing so fast, I guess it's really difficult to say. Um, I'm very excited about AR. So, our studio, we launched our first augmented reality game, Drive Ahead Mini Mini Golf, just yesterday. So, I'm very interested in to seeing how this market will develop in the next uh, year or two. If you look at ten ten year perspective, then maybe games will be everywhere. Maybe like your glasses could be a, a, a platform for playing games. I'd love that. Yeah, yeah, so maybe, you know, like, uh, it will be very interesting to see what kind of sessioning games will have when people could basically be playing all the time. 
Uh, what do you think uh, is uh, more important uh, in a game, like one of its aspects, uh, the ever-discussed questions, the graphics, the gameplay, the game design, uh, the storytelling maybe? Um, we usually start with a fun core gameplay. So, of course, we want to make fun, cool games. But we found that that's not enough. So you need to make sure that uh, your players have a reason to return to the game often and they want to return with their friends. So I think planning this progression and making sure that there are some kind of events like live operations, I think that's very important. And though everybody knows monetization is important, like just thinking of the, the path the player takes in the game and when, when are they presented with opportunities to spend money or watch videos or do something like that, like connecting the revenue model with making the game experience better. I think that's, that's very crucial. Uh, do you have a vision of a video game you'd like to create if you weren't restricted in absolutely no way, like financially, creatively? There's only one right answer to this, and that is that if we would have no financial restrictions, we would be doing the exact same thing that we're doing now. So I believe that the format that we have developing games with minimum risk and investment, testing concepts early with players, and, and launching games thanks to this wonderful, large and active community that we have with, uh, with Drive Ahead is the way that we would want to do it, you know, regardless of what kind of budget we have. Sounds fair. Uh, let's come back to the real world for a moment. What do you think about St. Petersburg? St. Petersburg is a wonderful place. We've been blessed by wonderful weather this time. Uh, I heard from the locals that we're very lucky to enjoy this nice weather. Uh, I've had the opportunity to visit St. Petersburg uh, three times during the last year for a couple of events. And I'm always excited to meet the local developers. Uh, our drive ahead game uh, on Android Russia is the largest market for us. And, and this is something that we, we want to understand better, like why people like the game here and, and, and see how we as a studio could be more present in Russia and, and be closer to our flat fans, the players on, on Russian social media. So that's why I'm always interested to, to visit Russia and meet people if I have the chance. Well, now you have the chance, another one um, at this uh, uh, event for C. And what do you think about it? Uh, I've had a chance to talk at many international events in China and the US GDC and places in Europe. I think uh, 4C is the best organized event I've ever been to. You, know, you guys are taking really good care of the guests and, and the lineup is awesome. So uh, I'm giving a talk myself, but uh, the rest of the time I have a full schedule of listening to presentations. So usually when you go, I go to these international conferences, I'm quite tied up with meeting partners. But here I'm really going to enjoy going to the talks myself and hearing what the experiences people share. Uh, and if you were interviewing yourself right now, what question would you like to ask yourself? <laughs> what question would I like to ask myself? I'd probably ask that why do I have this wonderful beard? Why do you? Well, I'll tell you guys a secret. So I'm actually the great great-grandson of Santa Claus and that's why I have this beard and and Santa Claus said to me that you have to learn how to bring people of the world joy so that's why for the next about 200 years I'm gonna be the CEO of the Do Dreams game studio and one day in about 200 years when my beard is all white then I will become the next Santa Claus really looking forward to it and from the presence from you. Uh, what are you looking forward to? What's uh, maybe the speech that you'd like to hear most? Anything specific? I love all these like demos and, and case studies that people do. I, I, I really like the, the talks where, where people go through some project and, and, and go through their experiences. So, so I'm, I have several of those in my schedule. Great, sounds exciting. And now children all, all over the world are excited for a new Santa. And uh, I hope you have a good time here. Thank you. Thank you.